And even though the friend, a friend, a Quaker, could be expelled from the monthly meeting for frequenting taverns, Samuel Mavic did not have a problem selling liquor. Carmine said in his book that rum was the main source of profit for him. Plus, many old timers would tell of the large numbers of hogshead of rum stored in Mavic's basement. Each hogshead was 63 gallons of rum. His business thrived, not only with his neighbors, but with past travelers passing through the Hudson Valley to the on what was then called the King's Highway. And it was really a, a path, scarcely cleared of stumps and trees. Later on, I'm not sure when, Samuel turned the store part over to his son, John Joseph, and his wife, Hannah. And while Samuel still ran the tavern in. The rest of the information I have on Samuel Mavic, most of it came from George Clinton's papers, the governor of, the first governor of New York. And the first thing was a letter that was written by William Henry, and it was titled, Selecting a Capital for the State. Henry Williams wrote, after meeting Samuel and John Adams in Fishville, as they made their way from the General Congress, which was in Philadelphia to Boston, they earnestly wished an opening of the Court of Justice in this state. So, Williams consulted a number of legislators and decided that Goshen was too remote. All of these really didn't have the provisions and stores for the legislators to house them. And the objection was that Poughkeepsie or any place on the water was a risk of surprise of attack. So those were all ruled out. He then visited Quaker Hill and found no contraindications there. Then he came here saying, quote, yesterday I stooped at the Quakers after their meeting. Near Samuel Mavis, he was home with his wife near her time, and he proposed the latter to them. Further stating, he did not propose to deprive them of their meeting house, but that the legislature could actually sit in the tavern since it was so large. They answered that they were not in general of sufficient circumstances, nor did they raise a quantity of cattle or hay that the Quaker Hills did, but they consented that about 80 members might be lodged and accommodated within one and a half miles of the tavern. Or about 100 people within a two mile radius. But I guess that Henry Williams didn't know that Samuel Mavic was a Tory. He belonged to the band who had the motto, loyal and determined. And being in the French settlement did not mean he was always safe from violence, as many travelers passed through. By May of 1777, the Continental Conference Board ordered a Rufus Hendrick and David, Colonel Davis Sutherland to apprehend and bring his prisoner, Samuel and Joseph Mather, and Theo Bradley, among others. But they were gone from their home. They couldn't find them. And it was said by a tradition that Mather actually had a trap door in his dwelling where he could just escape whenever the Patriots got too vigilant. <laughs> Later that year, Captain Hendricks, plus several others, was empowered and directed to proceed immediately the home of Samuel and Joseph Mavis, and take inventory of their whole estate and to remove such parts thereof as in their discretion shall think proper to some place secure, provided that they leave enough for their families of wearing apparel and the necessary household furniture. By December 31st of 1777, the Colonel of Safety 
had Mavic actually in custody. He said that he had been in New Hampshire in 1776 and was for his own safety and denied being any part of the enemy. But he was let go, he was discharged from his confinement after paying 2,000 pounds. But I don't think that lasted long, because by August of the next year, he refused, still refused to take the oath of allegiance. And he was one of three in Dutchess County and one in Ulster County that refused. So Joseph, at that point, was must have taken the oath of allegiance, his son. And then there are several letters from uh, Colonel Melton concerning the transport of his family. Samuel Mabbitt and by a flagship. And I guess a flagship was one that was allowed to go up and down the Hudson Free through enemy lines back and forth because they were declared that they were not carrying uh, anything that would, any soldiers or any weapons or anything else. And then uh, by, they were trying to decide how to transport Samuel Mabbitt down there and exchange him for other prisoners to come back up here from the uh, British. And then in May of 79, there was uh, General Jones, from the British, a British lieutenant, was trying to negotiate to send his family down. And the day before he signed that order, there's a letter. Samuel Mabbitt actually wrote to Governor Clinton. Now, this is the middle of the revolution. So just understand how um, this really puts forth the tone of civility that was between the two parties. May it please the governor, before I left home, I did myself an honor of calling on me and receiving that promise that my family should be sent to me whenever I applied for them. Such was their situation last autumn, owing to the illness of my children, that it became impossible for them to be with me. But I have not the least doubt that he will now permit me to enjoy the pleasure of seeing persons so dear to me, as I have obtained a flag for the purpose of bringing them down. Likewise, great, grant them equal indulgence with others in mine and their circumstance. Upon this occasion, I flatter you myself that even in your exclusiveness of thy promise, I must trust to the sentiments and the humanity with what you have obliged your friends. And then he goes on to ask who should come. But then it didn't really happen right then because there was still a negotiation of trying to get uh, people. Clinton first said he would do it, and then he said he wouldn't, and then he came back and forth, and eventually, uh, I guess they were allowed down. I'm not sure. I couldn't find the documentation of that. But what I do know. was that by, um, after the war, Samuel had moved to Lansingburg, New York, which is near Troy. And he died sometime before 1792. Because in that year, the laws of New York, the first session of the Congress in April of 1792, it was further enacted that the said treasury shall pay Joseph S. Mabbitt, administrator of Samuel Mabbitt's deceased, the sum of 650 pounds in satisfaction of property improperly taken during the war from the said Samuel Mabbitt by the commissioners of the sequestration. So they took his property, they sold it, kept it in the state treasury, and then they gave it back. But by 1795, Joseph Babbitt sold the inn, tavern, store to the friends. And that actually became the Nine Partners School. It was enlarged from the 50 by 
40 foot to actually be 99 foot long, but they kept it in the same pattern that it was originally, with gabled roofs and the big basement. Um, so that they didn't want to make it 100 foot because they didn't think that sounded quite as big as 99 foot. So, you want to put the slide up for the someone? At the very end of the presentation. Oh, okay. We'll have to wait and see what it looks like then. All right. Now I'm going to turn it over to Will, and Will can tell you more about Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2019 Dutchess County Historic Tavern Trail. Thank you for joining us for our inaugural program where you get to see me do things like play around with wires, which is always an entertaining circus trip. So if you guys have had enough history, we can uh, go back to wine and food and other things. I mean, it's not how yet. Are you up for a little bit more history? done an exceptional job of giving you a very local look, and we will in fact be seeing an image of the Nine Partner School, which unfortunately did not stand the test of time. It was pulled down, but you can still see the meeting house there. I will be pulling that lens out just a little bit to look at the theme of historic taverns in Dutchess County, very early taverns, specifically between about 1740 and 1820 in general. And we're going to be doing a couple of things in this presentation. And for those of you who are way off in the other corner there, you may want to take this opportunity to relocate because this is an image-heavy presentation. On the other hand, if the dulcet tones of my voice alone are sufficient to entertain you, I'm not going to argue with that. We're going to be doing three things this evening, exploring three questions. The first is, what did these taverns, these early ones, look like from the outside? How can you, perhaps, when you're driving down one of Dutchess County's many historic byways, see a building to think that could probably have been a tavern once upon a time. And what changes happened between the 1740s and 1820s? The second question is, what did all of these buildings look like on the inside, especially since many structures that were taverns once upon a time have gone through many, let's say, remodelings in the space of their hundreds of years of service? And we'll look both at primary sources from the period that tell us what these things look like, as well as a, a couple of attempts by more modern historians to give an idea of what these look like in actual, real, living color. And then finally, or actually number three, there's one more, there's four, three, what hoops did an individual have to jump through in order to run a tavern in the first place? You do have to be certified to do this after all. And then finally, what kinds of rough and rowdy behavior might one find associated with the tavern, which of course we save the best stuff for last. That's the really salacious and uh, gossipy material. So, first off is one of the early taverns of Dutchess County. This is Steenberg's Tavern in Rhinebeck, somewhere off of Route 9. I have not personally successfully located it, which probably means it's very easily visible on Route 9. And I just drive right by it every day on the way to work. But uh, as you can see, it's a relatively small structure. It's essentially one story with a sleeping loft and an attic up above. And this is what you would be looking at for most of early Dutchess. So from the late 17th century through the American Revolution, what taverns are is essentially you have a house because you're a farmer. You're located near some sort of path or if you're very lucky, a road, some sort of transportation and enough people go by that you think to yourself, wow, if I open one room of this house and serve liquor out of it, I can make some sideline <laughs> income. That's how your taverns spring up originally. They started as private homes that cater to travelers, and then somewhere along the way it occurs to the head of household, if we just build a specific room solely for serving alcohol, maybe we don't have to farm as hard anymore. Now, by the period of the revolution, the post-revolutionary struggle, 1790s through the 1820s, you go from those early Indian paths, ox cart paths, and whatnot of the early 1700s to actual roads. So 1785, modern Route 9, the post road actually gets its first 
stagecoach route. And one of the stops on that stagecoach route is something that you can still visit today. That's the historic Mountain Dwarf Inn up in the village of Red Hook, still in its original location from when the first part of it was built in the 1750s and 60s. And this shows change over time. So originally, when the Mountain Dwarf started off, it was just this little section here, 1750s or 1760s farmhouse. By 1796, it was transformed into a dedicated hotel and tavern operation with space up above that was specifically meant for travelers to stay, and the great south room here, which you would see coming up Route 9, which was, uh, among other things, an area for dancing, but also where the town of Redhook split off from the town of Rhinebeck. The town of Redhook was established in that room in 1812, and the town held both its board meetings and its court meetings in there probably through the mid-1820s. We're still being specific years on that ride. So you go from sort of itsy bitsy teeny weeny to a rather grand structure, but it gets grander still when you come a little bit more easterly and you get things like Jackson's or Jackson Wings Inn, formerly in Woodendale. I don't think this is still standing. Is this still standing? No. no. And to just give a little shout out, we have both of our town of Denver historians here tonight, Caroline Weichenberg and Valerie Lillard with you. And I'd like to point them out along with the other wonderful ladies of the Dover Historical Society because they will be hosting and presenting at our Max Tavern Trail, which is at the Taper Wing House in Dover Plains in May, on May 17th, if my memory is serving me tonight. And I throw this up here mostly to show you how large a tavern can be. That's essentially three stories, but also to point out that you'll hear more about this tavern and another Wing Tavern and Wayne's post office from Val during that presentation based off her long-standing research into Chestnut Ridge. And a little, little sneak peek of one of the Slacy stories, if you notice from this GPS map here, the town line between Dover and I believe Unionville runs right through the middle of the structure. So guess what happens if one town decides to go dry? <laughs> exactly. You can move the bar. Wonderful placement. I don't know if that was purposeful on their part or not. So we've looked at the outside. These things vary from little teeny tiny structure to huge three-story grand edifices. But what do we look like on the inside? We go back to the Elmendorf because it has been restored more or less to how it would have appeared between 1815 and 1825 and is open to the public for visitation. So, how do we know what they were supposed to look like? We have artwork by a fellow named John Lewis Crennel. He was an artist who was active on Long Island in the opening decades of the 19th century, so the 18 teens and the 1820s, and his particular joy was documenting everyday scenes of life in America, specifically on Long Island. But he left us two very famous images of the inside of a tavern. You have here the inside of the American Inn, 1814, and then you have the slightly more famous ballroom dancing, largely because a lot of really naughty things are happening, and we'll talk about that in a future tavern term. But one thing that I would draw your attention to right up front is this strange apparatus with cagey lattice work, and kind of looks like it's designed to close up. That's the bar and it's called the cage bar for a reason that you will figure out in just a second. But notice that they have tables, they have chairs, they have the bar, they have all the booze and the tobacco and the other good stuff behind the bar. And if we go to the interior of the Amador Inn into their tap room, you have a very similar setup that you can go and visit today. You have your tables, your chairs, a fireplace to keep you warm. There's only one thing missing. The remains of it are actually up here in the ceiling, and there's a plexiglass panel that you can look at and see the physical remains of it. That is the cage bar, which would have looked something like that, except in this case, the Elmendorf's was round a half moon cage. So what is special about the cage bar? Here's an up-close look at it. It's called a cage because of those slats up there, which actually will come down and close the bar. So when they talk about last call, in the 18th and 19th century, they're very serious because after they've given you their last drink, they are going to lock the bar so that you cannot reach through and help yourself to liquor after hours. And of course, 
even if you thought you might do so, you might encounter scary people like this guy here, a very old friend of mine, this bar is actually up in the sort of Eastfield Village in Rensselaer County, just east of Alton. And this is a shot from a living history event we did at Red Hook back in February, the Elmendor event, which gives you an idea of how we use costume interpretation to bring these spaces alive for the public today. So we've gone through the inside, we've gone through the outside. The next question is, how do you have a bar in the first place? Pre-revolutionary era, since you're serving out of your house, it's really no biggie, but one of the first things that the brand new state of New York figures out how to do after the revolution is over is licensing, because it's revenue stream. So what you end up having, and these come from our county ancient documents collection, those are the court records of the Dutchess County Court of Common Pleas and General Sessions. They are up online on the county clerk's website, and we are very lucky to have our county clerk, Brad Kendall, here today. And everything that you see me doing is made possible with Brad's support. He is a huge champion of local history, so bear that in mind. But a tavern for cognizance, I won't bore you with the nitty gritty of all the legal stuff. It's essentially the license that says you can run a tavern as long as you don't do certain things. And all of those certain things are down here. I'll read them out to you briefly. So that if the above bounding person, in this case a guy named Abel Peters, is not supposed to keep at his inner tavern, a disorderly inner tavern, which is, okay, what does disorderly mean? But specifically, he's not to suffer or permit any cockfighting, gaming, or playing at cards or dice, or keep any billiard table or other gaming table or dramatic pause. Shuffleboard. Yeah, shuffleboard, big issue. Within the tavern or in any outbuilding, specifically in the outhouse or anywhere within the yard. So it's okay to serve booze, but you can't have any form of gambling, including shuffleboard, which in the 1640s, shuffleboard was you know, the, the black jack of its era. People were using or losing untold amounts of cash on the shuffleboard table. And these were not the Florida shuffleboards with the long handles. These were tabletop shuffleboards that were banned throughout New England during the 17th century. And it all goes back to an English common law. It's okay to gamble, it's okay to drink, it's not okay to drink and gamble. Yeah, exactly. Who thought that was a good idea? So now we're getting into the, the rowdy behavior. I'm glad that you all have stuck around. So Abel Peters, he's the guy, maybe, who gets this tavern license. Two years earlier, in 1797, we also have an Abel Peters. We're not sure it's the same Abel Peters because in the 18th and 19th century it was very popular to name your son your name, but not necessarily the junior or the third or the 17th. Depends how long how people have decided not to be creative with the naming conventions. But we do have this narration where a fellow named Richard Doty, and some of you who may come from around the Pleasant Valley area know that that name goes way back in Central Duchess, is complaining of Abel Peters, claiming that. Peters had, with forced arms, to wit, with six days, fist and feet, assaulted him. So two years before Abel Peters, if it's the same guy, gets a tavern license, he is beating a fellow resident of Dutchess County up with sticks and his fists and his feet, which might give you a little bit of an idea of the character of some of these uh, tavern keepers, and might explain some of the things that we're going to see popping up. So first, yes, hooligans, definitely. If they aren't hooligans personally, they tend to attract them. Another document we have here is an indictment. This is actually what happens if you violate the terms of your tavern license and keep a disorderly house. You're brought before a grand jury. If they think that there's actually proof against you doing something bad, you're indicted. And in this case, Joe Mulford, nice old biblical Old Testament name, of Clinton has been charged and that he kept a, uh, a tavern, a house, for his own lucre and gain, and entertained certain evil and ill-disposed persons of evil name and fame, and of dishonest conversation, allowing them to frequently come together there, and to be and remain drinking, tickling, and misbehaving themselves unlawfully, which makes me wonder, what is a lawful business? <laughs> I'm interested in that personally. 
but behaving himself unlawfully and allowed that to go on all day and all night long. And this disorderly house charge actually survives through the 20th century. A lot of speakeasies in Dutchess County in the 20s and early 30s are actually prosecuted as disorderly houses rather than as violating the sure. So that's what's going to happen to you, but sometimes the violence of the tavern comes to you. You don't have to go to it. Like this indictment from 1792, where Jonas Kelsey of the town of Poughkeepsie, who is identified as a tavern keeper, travels to Clinton in order to beat up a fellow named Jacob Smith in the home of Timothy B. out in Clinton. So he makes a trip, to, you know, maybe do a hit, maybe do a little bit of boxing, and then is caught for it and taken back to Poughkeepsie and at least charged. We don't have the rest of that trial on hand yet. And then I, I hope that you all you've all kept your enthusiasm at a high peak because we're coming to the the triumphant and somewhat savage end of our presentation tonight on Tavern. So we have an image up here of enslaved African Americans. I'd like to introduce you to Isaac Caesar and Sam. They're enslaved African Americans in Poughkeepsie in the mid 18th century. Does anyone have a feeling of foreboding something bad like by about to, to roll out? It just so happens that this incident occurs on April 23rd, 1749, not too far away from where we are today. So what happens on April 23rd? We have Justice's court minutes. Got a little bit there if you want to read it. Essentially what happens is you have several seriously powerful individuals of Dutchess County, including a fellow named Peter Tenbrook, who come together in Poughkeepsie to hold a justice's court to explore what Caesar and um, his friends have been up to. So it begins when Justice of the Peace Tenbrook says that uh, the previous evening he'd been sitting on his front porch near Poughkeepsie and watched these three enslaved individuals go by and that he overheard, and I quote, three slaves utter some treasonable discourse trending to a conspiracy, and that these slaves being the property of Mr. Yelberton and Captain Newcomb and a Bowermine account. Now that's a great name, Bowermine. He thought fit to bring this to the attention of his fellow justices, who incidentally included Mr. Yelberton and Captain Newcomb, also justices of the peace like him, and to investigate into this. So, Justice of the Peace, Tinbrook, has said, I saw three enslaved individuals going by. It sounded to me like they were talking about maybe having slave revolts here in Poughkeepsie, which is not something we tend to think about in regards to slavery in the Hudson Valley. That seems to be more of a southern thing. But instead of just sort of putting their heads together and deciding what happened, they actually decided to ask the three enslaved individuals, what's your version of these events? And it began with Caesar. So Caesar gives a pretty um, amazing account of what college students wish they could achieve today as far as all-night vendors go. So according to Caesar, the previous evening the party began at 8 o'clock at the French doctor's house. So he states that at the French doctor's house, he and his two other friends had one dram and one pot of cider and then paid the doctor's mother in so there's another element to the slavery connection is that they have money to buy drinks and they're being served in the same sort of establishments that everyone else is using. So they start off the night, that one gram, probably a drunk, one pot of cider. Then they go on to the house of one of the, uh, the other slaves' masters where the, the mistress of the house permitted the slaves to drink three pots of cider. And Caesar paid his share there. Then, at that point, they passed Tenbrook's house. And according to Caesar, they were just talking about how much fun they were going to have hunting in the future, and that's what the references to guns and gunpowder was about, not a slave uprising. But they continue on their way to a Mr. Everett's house, and this could very easily be Clear Everett, who became sheriff of Dutchess County a few, a few years later, where they had a mug of beer each, and then concluded their evening at Colonel Van Cleek's house where they drank until the early daybreak. So 8 o'clock p.m. 
until like five, six o'clock the next morning. I'd say that is something certainly worthy of a college movie with uh, animal house stature, if not something even more interesting. So Isaac and Sam, the other two slaves who were charged in this situation, basically give the same account. We don't know if they were there listening to Caesar give his story so that they could come up and think to themselves, yes, we can say the same thing. That would be more believable. Or if they were kept separate, and it's just that this is what happened. But in the end, after hearing all this testimony, the justices of the peace decide that they're going to put the three slaves in jail, which at that point in time was in the basement of the Poughkeepsie Courthouse. And that would have been the second courthouse, which was on the same site that our current county courthouse occupies today. Five courthouses in all on that site so far. So they put the slaves in jail, and then they called the constable to pull together a petite jury of five freeholders and decide that the following day they will try and determine the above affair. So we unfortunately do not know what happens to Isaac, Sam, and Caesar, but it is one of those, those points for additional research that we will be pursuing as we continue to explore the ancient documents, and you can explore them yourselves online at the County Clerk's website. They are keyword searchable at duchessny.gov forward slash. We really want to get there quickly. The County Clerk or ancient documents, all one word. So at that juncture, that concludes our presentation tonight. Are there any questions? Hearing none, I will say let's get back to the real purpose. What? What? Oh, you want to see Mavit's picture, right? I'm going to fast forward through a few things that I decided not to talk about because I don't like to stand between people and food. And there it is the image itself of the Nine Partner School, and you can see that doorway in the stone basement where Diane was talking about the big kegs of rum being delivered. And rum was definitely the favorite up here at the time. There was wine around, but that was more of a gentleman's drink, not usually served in the tavern. Any other questions? Yes. What is the exact location, people of Millbrook? Because I don't know off the top of my head. But the village historians here. Well, that was basically just Ah. So essentially it was immediately adjacent to the meeting house. On 343. If you talk to John Flanagan, he may get you a tour of the meeting house. But you didn't hear it from me. Any other questions? Is anyone hungry? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience. Okay. When this was sold uh, in, I think, 1864, it was sold to uh, Wing, and he moved it up on nine partners and became part of the San Antonio estate. Fantastic. The question is, does it still exist? Not to my knowledge. I think it's been demolished. And the other important announcement, by the way, is if you were inclined to buy a bottle of wine tonight, 20% of all bottle sales will be donated to the Millbrook Historical Society. With your version on the edge there, donate and buy for history. So, at this point, I will release you all. We will turn the lights back on. And please enjoy the rest of your time here at the lovely Millbrook Vineyards and Wine. Thank you.